Welcome to the 999 Lifesaver video. This video contains safety and first aid information to equip you to save a life. And we hope it'll give you the confidence to know what to do. think it could never happen to us but every year in this country thousands of people are faced with unexpected emergencies and have to cope as best they can but would you know what to do we've put together a special 999 video to show you some of the most common emergencies you're likely to come across we cover everything from simple advice on what to have in your first aid kit to what to do if you're first on the scene of a road accident the video consists of 24 different information films. Now, to make it easy to use, we've numbered each of them. The number appears in the bottom left-hand corner of the video, so that when you fast forward, you'll be able to find the film that you want easily. To help you find your way around the video, there's an index coming up next, or you can use the index card in the video pack. We hope this video will be an invaluable reference guide and help give you the confidence to be able to cope before the emergency services arrive. But remember, it's no substitute for going on a proper life-saving course to learn the correct procedures at first hand. And we'll give you details of how to get on a course at the end of the video. The ABC of resuscitation and how to put somebody into the recovery position are the two most important first aid skills you can learn. And once you've mastered those, you're well on the way to being equipped to save a life. Whatever the accident or medical emergency, whether it's a suspected heart attack, an electric shock, a drowning or a car crash, you'll always need to know the ABC of resuscitation and how to put somebody into the recovery position. This information film shows you what to do step by step in both cases. The Resuscitation Council has helped us make the film, but they say it's still no substitute for going on a first aid course yourself. The ABC stands for airway, breathing and circulation, the three most important things to keep the brain supplied with oxygen. A is for airway, your airway runs through the mouth and nose to the lungs and must be open and clear to allow oxygen into your body. B is for breathing. When you breathe, oxygen is absorbed into the blood to keep vital organs like the brain and the heart working properly. If the brain is starved of oxygen for more than three minutes, it becomes severely damaged any longer and you'll die. C is for circulation. The heart pumps blood carrying oxygen around your body to other organs like the brain and this is your circulation. In a moment we'll show you what to do if you find somebody with a blocked airway who's not breathing and has no circulation. But what you must always remember is that the ABC is exactly the same for any emergency and must be done first. Never put yourself in danger. You won't be able to help if you become a casualty too. It's vital you check for any hazards like live wires or broken glass. Next, you'll need to check for a response to know whether they're unconscious or just asleep. You can do this using the shake and shout method. Shake them gently by the shoulders and shout loudly, are you all right? If they don't respond, they're unconscious and they're going to need your help. 
don't be tempted to dial 999 yet. You must do the ABC first so that you can give the emergency services as much information as possible. The ABC check will only take you 30 seconds. If somebody is with you, make sure they stay. If you're alone, shout out loudly to attract attention. Airway. First, make sure their airway is clear. To do this, you need to check their mouth for any obvious obstructions. If you do find something, remove it gently with your fingers. Don't remove false teeth unless they're really loose or broken. When someone's unconscious, they lose control of their tongue. It becomes floppy and sometimes blocks the airway. So put one hand on their forehead and use two fingers of the other hand to lift the chin and tilt the head back slightly. This will automatically clear the tongue from their airway. Opening somebody's airway may be all you have to do to get them breathing again. According to a professor of emergency medicine, 80% of the people killed in road accidents before they reach hospital could have survived if their airways had been cleared by the first person on the scene of that accident. And it could be you. Breathing. Next, check for breathing. To do this, you need to look, listen and feel. Look to see if their chest is rising, although if they're wearing heavy clothing or lots of layers, it may not be clear. So listen as well by putting the side of your face close to theirs and listen for breath sounds. At the same time, feel for any breaths on your cheek. Do all three at once for five seconds and always remember that their breaths may be very faint. If you hear an irregular or occasional gasp, it isn't normal, so ignore it. Circulation. To check the circulation of blood around the body, you need to feel for a pulse. Try to find the one in the neck by putting two fingers on one side between their Adam's apple and the muscle running up the side of the neck and push inwards for five seconds. Don't use the pulse on the wrist because it can become weak when someone's unconscious and you may not be able to find it. It's a good idea to practice feeling for a pulse both on yourself and a member of your family. A healthy one should be about 60 to 80 beats a minute. If you found that the person is unconscious, not breathing, and hasn't got a pulse, you must now dial 999. If somebody is with you, send them, but make sure they have all the information and come back to tell you an ambulance is on the way. If you're alone, you must make the call yourself. You are now a vital link in the casualties chain of survival. By starting resuscitation, you're in effect their life support system until the emergency services arrive. If you don't try to help, you might just as well leave them for dead. Unconscious, no breathing, no pulse. Remember, the airway should be kept clear before you start to breathe for them. Pinch their nose closed, seal your lips around their mouth and give two breaths, remembering to come up for air yourself in between. Each breath should take you about two seconds. And make sure no air is escaping from their nose or mouth and check that their chest falls after each breath. If you can't see the chest moving or you feel any resistance, then recheck their airway. There have been no reported cases of diseases being passed on this way, but if you're really worried, you can get a face guard like this. Some of them come in keyings, so don't let it stop you trying to save a life. Now you need to start chest compressions to get their circulation going. Make sure the casualty is on a hard, flat surface before you begin. You may need to undo heavy jackets so you can find the spot where their ribs join their breastbone and measure two fingers up from there. On the average adult, this will be the line between their nipples. Keeping your fingers there, place the heel of your other hand alongside and then put your first hand on top. With your fingers interlocked and elbows straight, push down with both hands and do 15 compressions. To keep a rhythm going, it might help to count one and two and... Your shoulders should be directly over your hands and you should use your body weight, not muscle power, to push down to a depth of about four or five centimetres. On the average adult, weighing about 12 stone, you'll probably need to do this as hard as you physically can. To get an idea how hard this is, you can use a tennis ball and some bathroom scales. It's really important that you feel confident about what you're doing. 
Kneel on the floor next to the scales, with one hand over the other, fingers interlocked and elbows straight, and push down on the tennis ball to a weight of around five stone or 70 pounds. This is about the same force needed for chest compressions. But remember, there's a very different technique for infants and children, and the one we've just shown you could harm a child. So make sure you watch the infant resuscitation film straight after this one. Once you've started resuscitation, don't stop until the paramedics arrive and take over. It'll be hard work, so if someone else is with you, take it in turns to repeat the cycle of two breaths to 15 compressions. Only interrupt the cycle if you see any signs of life, but don't expect a miracle. If the heart has stopped, you simply won't be able to restart it. Only the professionals can do that with a defibrillator. You're buying the casualty time until the ambulance arrives. Unconscious, no breathing, with a pulse. This could happen if someone's been in a drowning accident. So if you find they're not breathing, but have a pulse, you'll have to follow these next instructions and breathe for them. Remember to keep the airway clear. Pinch their nose closed and completely seal your mouth around theirs. Give 10 breaths at your normal breathing rate, which is around one breath every five seconds. If somebody is with you, send them to phone for an ambulance as soon as you've done the ABC. If you're alone, you should do the first 10 breaths, and then if there's no response, leave the casualty to get help. When you return, recheck their breathing and pulse, because the situation may have changed. If they're still not breathing, but there's a pulse, repeat the cycle of 10 breaths, checking their breathing and circulation in between each one. If they start to breathe for themselves, put them in the recovery position, but keep checking for breathing and a pulse, and wait for the ambulance to get there. Unconscious, breathing with a pulse. If you find somebody in this situation, you'll need to put them in the recovery position. This keeps their airway clear and makes sure they don't choke if they vomit. Kneel by the casualty and remember to tilt their head slightly back. Place their arm nearest to you at right angles to their body, just like a policeman's stop sign. Then take their other arm and put it across their chest, holding the back of their hand against their cheek. Use your other hand to pull the furthest leg up so the foot is flat on the ground and keeping their hand against their cheek Pull down with the knee and roll them towards you. Make sure the airway remains open. Then check their upper leg is at right angles to the body and keep checking for breathing and circulation. If you think a casualty may have suffered a neck injury, or for example a motorcyclist had been involved in an accident and you don't know whether to remove their helmet, remember that you must still clear their airway and do the rest of the ABC. If you gently lift their chin, it won't make the situation worse, but you have to make sure they can breathe. If you then discover they're breathing and have a pulse, leave the crash helmet on. But if their breathing has stopped, you'll need to take it off to breathe for them. But be careful not to move their head from side to side while you do this. So remember, check and clear the airway. It may be all you need to do to help someone breathe again. Look, listen and feel for breathing. Feel for a pulse to check the circulation of the blood around the body. Unconscious, no breathing, no pulse. Give two breaths to 15 chest compressions. Unconscious, no breathing with a pulse. Give 10 breaths, but no chest compressions. Unconscious, breathing with a pulse. Put them in the recovery position. This may all seem complicated and a lot to remember, so go back and watch it again and keep watching it to refresh your memory. The ABC and the recovery position are so important that if you remember what we've shown you in this video, you could save a life.
Cot death is the greatest single cause of death in infants over a month old in the United Kingdom. Ten babies die every week, and many of those deaths could be prevented with some basic resuscitation skills. It's a lesson for life. Remember, the resuscitation techniques for infants under a year old are different from those for adults. For a start, when breathing for a baby, you must only use as much breath as you use blowing out a candle. And when doing chest compressions, you must use the tips of two fingers and press down very carefully. St John Ambulance has helped us put together a ten-point plan to show you the basics of what to do. Remember, this is only a guide, and to be properly prepared, you should go on a first aid course. If your baby stops breathing or is having obvious difficulty, time is essential to their survival, so it's very important that you help them immediately. Never leave the baby alone. Shout loudly to try to get help from a neighbour or passerby. Pick up the baby, shake and pinch them gently, and talk to them to try to wake them. If there's no response, place them on a firm surface. Open their airway. Put one hand on the forehead and one or two fingers under the chin. Gently tilt the head backwards. This will lift the baby's tongue away from the back of the throat. Look into the baby's mouth. Very carefully remove anything lodged there. Do this with one finger sweep. Don't touch the back of the throat. This is very soft and may swell or bleed, blocking the airway. Babies usually breathe through their nose, so you'll need to check the nostrils are clear too. Check the baby's breathing. Place an ear close to their mouth and listen for breathing. Feel for their breath on your cheek and look to see if the chest is rising and falling. Do this for five seconds. If baby is still not breathing, you'll need to breathe for them. Seal your lips around the mouth and nose. Breathe into baby until you see the chest rise, as if it's taking a deep breath. As the chest rises, take your mouth away and allow baby to exhale. Do this five times. Now check the pulse. It's best to do this on the inside of the upper arm. Lightly press your fingers towards the bone and hold for five seconds. If you feel a pulse, continue to breathe for the baby, checking the pulse regularly. If there's no pulse, or if the pulse is less than one beat per second, the heart isn't working properly, so you must take over its work. Find the spot just below the line joining the baby's nipples in the centre of the breastbone. Place two fingers here and press to a depth of about two centimetres. Do this five times and then blow gently into the lungs once. If there's still no response from the baby after carrying out these procedures for one minute, dial 999 immediately. Keep the resuscitation going until medical help arrives. It's important to realise that this top ten on infant resuscitation is only a guide. To be properly prepared to resuscitate a baby, you should go on a first aid course to learn and to practise all the points that we've mentioned. But remember, you should never practise this procedure on a healthy baby. In an emergency, most of us would have the presence of mind to ring 999, but would we be thinking clearly enough to give the vital information the emergency services need to get to the scene as quickly as possible? And if you were in an emergency with only a young child in the house, would they know what to do? Remember, even children as young as three have been known to make that vital 999 call, so it's never too early to learn. The emergency service number 999, so familiar to us today, was first introduced in 1937. If you need to ring 999, remember that all emergency calls are free. They can be made 24 hours a day from any telephone in the country. If you're in a park or street, it may be quicker to ask at the nearest house than running to look for a phone box. If you're near a supermarket, pub or bank, don't be afraid to ask to use their phones. When you dial 999, your call triggers an alarm at one of the 15 emergency operator centres in the country. Operators respond immediately to 999 calls. When your call is answered, listen carefully to the operator. Emergency for which service? Speak clearly and tell them which service you need. Ambulance, fire, police or coast guard. 
VT Bristol connecting 0272 535 You can also ask to be connected to specialist services like the Mountain Rescue and Cave Rescue who are called out by the police. Give your number to the operator if they ask for it. When you ring 999, your number and address is usually displayed automatically. This means if you become unconscious or you can't talk, you can always be traced. It also means hoax callers can be caught more easily. Be warned, deliberate hoaxes are prosecuted and fined by the police. 999 calls are also recorded and the tapes used as evidence in hoax call prosecutions. While the operator is connecting you to the emergency service you need, think of the clearest way to describe the incident. Where it happened, the name of the street, name and number of the building and any nearby landmarks. What has happened, a road accident, fire or drowning. Who is hurt or ill, how many and how old they are. How badly are they hurt? If an incident needs more than one of the emergency services, the operator will connect you to each one in turn. Don't hang up until the emergency service asks you to do so. They may need more information from you. Never make a false call. It's against the law and could risk other people's lives. Most false calls are made by children, so never allow very young children to play with the telephone. Explain to them the importance of the 999 call. Children as young as three have been known to ring the right number and save their parents' lives. If you ever dial 999 by mistake, tell the operator you don't need an emergency service after all. If you hang up without saying anything, your call has to be traced to make sure it wasn't a genuine cry for help. More than 500 people are injured on Britain's roads every day. Everything from falling off a bicycle to a major incident with lots of people hurt. A car crash is probably one of the most distressing emergencies you could come across. But it may be up to you to take charge and do the right thing. Remember, it's nearly always better to do something rather than nothing. Often the accident site itself presents a real danger, mainly because of the oncoming traffic. So it's essential you make the area safe and protect yourself, the casualties and other road users. Be careful when you approach an accident. Park your car well behind the crashed vehicles. Warn others of the accident by turning on your hazard lights and wear something bright or reflective so you can be seen more easily. If it's dark, leave your headlights on. Ask others to direct traffic around the accident and set up a warning triangle. Get someone to phone for help. On motorways, there are free phones every mile and marker posts every 100 metres pointing in the direction of the nearest phone. Prevent fires. Don't let anyone smoke. There may be petrol, oil or inflammable chemicals spilt on the road. Vehicles with special Hazchem signs carry dangerous chemicals or loads that could emit poisonous fumes or catch fire. It could be extremely dangerous to approach such vehicles and it's best to leave it to the professionals, even if there are injured people needing help. Don't put yourself in danger. If the vehicles involved are safe, turn off their engines. Remember, someone who's shouting could be less seriously injured than someone just moaning. The totally silent person is the one most likely to need help first. Don't move anyone unless they're in immediate danger. And if a motorcyclist is hurt, you must leave their helmet on because of the danger of neck injury. Only take it off as a last resort if they aren't breathing or they're vomiting. If you're not careful, you could risk paralyzing them for life. Stay at the scene of an accident until help arrives. Try and reassure the casualties. Remember, it's an offence not to stop if you're involved in an accident. And if you see people in trouble, do stop and help. It could be you who needs that help one day. going to show you what it would actually be like if you happened across a road accident. 
The camera will become you as you approach the scene and are faced with instant decisions. What happens over the next few minutes could be crucial, and the choices you make could spell the difference between life and death. What's happened? Does anyone know what to do? We locked off the bike. I just heard a noise. Did you hear it by the car? Does anyone know what, what to do? No, it's just... All right, OK, don't worry. Don't panic. It's... You OK? It's all right, love. I'll, I'll, stop. I'll stop. Listen, I think she's dead. Well, what are we going to do? Keep calm. I'll tell you what to do. Decide who to help first. Yeah, but look at him. He's not moving. And Laura, listen, I think she's dying. We've got to do something. Yeah, yeah, but before you do anything else, make sure that somebody's called an ambulance. Oh, right. But everything that's going on, I forgot to do it. I'll do it right away. Yeah, hang on. Tell them exactly where you are and how many people are hurt. It's all right. I'll live around here. I'll tell them exactly where it is. Yeah, yeah, yes. Hold on. I'll be there. No, don't do anything until you know it's safe. Yeah, yeah, of course, right. Don't go near an accident if there's a risk of spilled petrol or chemicals. Oh, no, no, stay back. There's right. always the danger of fire, so stop people smoking. Yes, of course. You must put your own safety first. You won't help anyone if you become a casualty too. See to my husband. Please, thank you for Once you're sure it's safe, turn off the ignition, then put on the hazard lights to warn other drivers. So who needs help first? You know, if people are shouting, they're breathing. It's the people who are silent who could be in real danger. It's coming. The ambulance is on its way. Is she all right? She's still in a bad way. Let's take the helmet off. No. What? Don't move her if she's breathing. If she's damaged her neck or spine, you could paralyze her for life. We've got to do something. Yeah, some vital checks. Right. You need to find out if she's actually breathing. Gently tilt her head back and feel for a pulse. <coughs> oh, she's breathing. We're OK. Oh, great. Now, listen, you're OK. Just take it easy. Don't move, all right? Stay where you are. Ambulance is on its way. Take it easy. Look, get a blanket or a coat or something to cover with, all right? Anything. Right, OK. Oh, come on, Alan. Alan, please. please. Right, now, what about the other casualties? Can you help him? I, I don't think he's breathing. Please help him. If he's not breathing, he'll oh. die. You'll have to move him oh. now because you need to breathe for him. But you must get somebody to help you. I'll be right there. This is the only time you should move someone. It's vital to support his neck and his back in case he's injured his spine. And you must keep his back as straight as possible. We're going to need someone else. We need someone over here now! Come on! Right. Take his head. Right. Got it. But look, right. you've got to be quick. Oh, gently, gently. Without oxygen, the brain could be permanently damaged in three and a half minutes, and he's going to die if you don't help him. You've got to start giving the kiss of life and getting the heart going with chest compressions. If you don't know how to do this, then go on a course to learn. It could make the difference between life and death. Over here first! And keep going. Lots of people give up when they see the ambulance. Don't. Keep going until the paramedics are ready. OK, thank you. We'll take over now. There are many situations when you may find yourself first on the scene in an emergency, when somebody really needs your help. Would you know what to do if you are faced with somebody in trouble in the water? The following advice is from the Royal Life Saving Society. The first rule of life saving is don't enter the water unless it's absolutely necessary. Always try first to reach out to the casualty from the land or throw something in to help support them. If you have to go in, it's safer to wade than to swim, and only try to tow someone to safety if you're a trained lifesaver or if the person is unconscious. If you have to resuscitate someone in the water, it's better to use mouth to nose, but you can only do this in shallow water or by holding on to something. Tilt the head back and breathe steadily and strongly into their nose, keeping their mouth closed. Then open their mouth to let the air escape. 
If you bring someone out of the water, take care to support their head, then put them on their back and check for breathing and pulse. If they're breathing, put them in the recovery position. If they're not breathing or there's no pulse, call for help and then start resuscitation. Many people think drowning is due to the lungs filling with water, but swallowing even a small amount can lead to suffocation. Never force water out of the stomach or lungs, but allow it to drain away naturally. Make sure you keep the airway clear and keep them warm. Whether someone's been rescued from an indoor pool or a river or lake, always take them to hospital for a checkup. They're still at risk up to three days later from secondary drowning. This is a form of pneumonia because water is still in the lungs and it can be fatal. Our rivers, lakes and seas are so cold, it's now thought more people who get into difficulties die from the effects of cold than drowning. The body cools down 25 times faster in cold water than in the open air, so your temperature can drop dangerously low very quickly. Even if you're a powerful swimmer, the cold water will sap your strength and you could find yourself sinking. When the cold hits you, you may gasp and swallow water, which can make you panic. And a sudden change in temperature puts an extra strain on your heart, so be aware of the risk of heart attack. Too many people drown each year attempting rescues that are beyond them. So if you come across somebody in trouble in the water, remember the slogan, reach, throw, wade, row. Only ever go into the water yourself if you're a trained lifesaver. And if you want to go on a lifesaving course, then ask for details at your local swimming pool. A major part of being confident that you can cope in an emergency is simply being prepared. And part of that preparation is having a first aid kit available when you need it. By law, your place of work should have one, but you should think about keeping one at home and one here in the car. And remember to take one with you when you go on holiday. Make sure everybody in the family knows where it is and keep it well stocked so everything's there when you're called upon to use it. When you're making up a first aid kit, it's a good idea to consider the five things you should be able to do to treat an injury. First of all, you'll need to uncover an injury, so make sure you have a strong pair of scissors. These could be vital if you need to cut through clothing or footwear. Also, buy a good pair of tweezers. These are essential for removing splinters of glass or wood. Next, you'll need to clean the area. Soap and water is fine, but you could include some antiseptic wipes. Make sure they're the non-alcoholic sort. These won't cause skin irritation. Never use cotton wool. This may leave tiny particles inside a wound. If you can't wash your hands, you can reduce the chance of infection by wearing latex gloves, which will also protect you when dealing with blood and body fluids. If you're put off by the thought of carrying out mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing on a stranger, you could also include a special mask in your kit. You'll need to protect the injury from infection or further damage, so make sure you've got a selection of sticking plasters. You can buy types that shouldn't trigger allergies, but if in doubt, use a sterile dressing. Support strains and sprains with crepe bandages and keep a triangular bandage for a sling. You'll need some safety pins for fastening. Keep medication in your first aid kit to a minimum. You'll need painkillers for yourself and your family, but never advise someone you don't know to take them. They might have an allergy or problem you don't know about. Do include antihistamine cream for insect bites and stings. Keep a note of the contents in your first aid kit and their expiry dates. If items are too old, they might be completely ineffective and may even harm you, so get rid of them. The best way is to return them to your chemist for safe disposal. Write the emergency number of your doctor and casualty department inside the lid of your first aid kit. The last thing you'll want to do is search for these numbers if you need urgent medical advice. But remember, if it does turn into an emergency, dial 999. Keep your kit in an airtight container in a place where everyone can find it easily. It's also a good idea to keep a first aid kit in your car, and it's even law in countries like Germany, Austria and Greece, so check before you go.
And if you're planning a holiday, remember to add travel sickness pills, something for upset stomachs, and lotion for dealing with sunburn. If you're traveling further afield, you might want to take a sterile medical pack. This will contain hypodermic needles, dressings, syringes, and possibly blood transfusion equipment. A good first aid kit could be a real lifesaver until professional help arrives. So remember, you'll need to uncover the wound, clean it thoroughly, protect it from further infection, support strains or sprains, and your medication should include painkillers and antihistamine cream. More accidents happen in the familiar surroundings of our own homes than anywhere else. The one place that should provide a safe environment actually claims 4,000 lives a year, and 3 million more people need medical treatment. The sad fact is that most of those accidents would have been easily prevented. We hope that our next three information films will help prevent accidents in your home. They offer advice on how to plan a fire escape route, how to deal with burns and scalds, and some tips on electrical safety. The main thing to remember is never take a chance with electricity. It's dangerous for anything to get too close to overhead power lines, including kites, model planes, microlights and hot air balloons. And you don't have to make contact to cause a lethal flow. Electricity can jump across gaps. A good safety rule to follow is look out and look up, especially as overhead cables can be difficult to spot. They often look like phone cables on wooden telegraph poles, but they can carry up to 132,000 volts. If you find someone who's had a shock from a high voltage cable, stay away from them. You could risk getting a shock yourself. Call the emergency services. They'll contact the electricity company who will make sure the power is turned off at the control room. Never try to rescue someone until you're told officially it's safe to do so. Every year there are about 2,500 reported cases of people receiving electric shocks around the home and garden, but the true figure could be much higher. Never attempt any electrical work unless you're competent to do so, even wiring a plug. It takes only 400 milliamps of electricity to run a 100 watt light bulb, but a tenth of that current can still kill you. If someone receives an electric shock, the first thing to do is switch off the power and pull out the plug. Don't touch the person until you're absolutely sure it's safe. The casualty's heart and breathing may have stopped. If they're unconscious, check their airway, breathing and circulation, and before you begin resuscitation, make sure you call an ambulance. The person may also have external and internal burns. Remember, it's important to cool burns with lots of water and try to cover them with cling film to prevent infection. Water and electricity are a dangerous combination, so don't mow the lawn or use an electric hedge trimmer when it's wet. There's a safety device designed to reduce accidents, particularly in the garden. A residual current device, or RCD for short, detects the smallest flow of electricity to earth, then automatically cuts off the power. In Scotland, by law, all new homes must have RCDs fitted in garages and for outdoor sockets. It's recommended, but not compulsory elsewhere in the UK, but for as little as £20, you can protect your family by fitting one. There's a house fire every eight minutes in the United Kingdom, so a smoke alarm is a really essential safety item. But even if you've got one, you need to know what to do if fire does break out. The only way to survive is to be prepared, so plan that escape route now. Here to help you work out that route is a ten-point plan based on information from the Home Office. Plan your escape routes now. Don't wait until a fire starts. Work out where you're going to meet and how you're going to get out. It's possible your first choice may be blocked by fire, so always plan alternatives. Practice your escape routes as a family. You can turn it into a game for the children, but make sure they understand how serious it might be. If a fire starts at night, you could be in pitch darkness with a smoke alarm blaring, you could be close to panic. You need to know your way out with your eyes shut. 
You only have seconds. It takes just one and a half minutes for the heat in a room to get too intense for you to enter, and in three and a half minutes, the whole house might be engulfed in smoke. Use that time wisely. Shout to alert everyone in the house and make sure they follow the escape route. Don't stop to look for valuables or pets. Nothing is as precious as your life. Smoke is more deadly than fire. When a house is well ablaze, as few as five deep breaths of smoke can kill you. Smoke rises, so you need to keep low and crawl out. Don't investigate the fire. Only open doors that are on your escape route, and before opening any door, use the back of your hand to see if it's warm. If it is, there's fire behind it, so keep it closed and find another route out. If all your escape routes are blocked and you're trapped inside the house, get everyone in the safest room and close the door behind you. Block the gaps with blankets or clothing. This will keep you safe for longer than you think. If you're on the first floor, know which window it's safest to use, but never jump straight out. Drop cushions and bedding to the ground to break your fall, then lower yourself to arm's length before dropping to the ground. If you can't open the window or if it's double glazed and difficult to break, use a heavy object to hit one of the bottom corners. And before climbing out, make jagged edges safe with a towel or blanket. When you're out, stay out. Go to a neighbor's house or the nearest phone box to dial 999. Never attempt to fight the fire yourself. Leave it to the professionals. Remember the slogan, get out, get the fire brigade out, and stay out. Small children are fascinated by steaming kettles or boiling pans. Accidents with hot liquids cause most burns and scalds to youngsters. Remove the source of heat immediately, including any hot, wet clothing. It's important to cool all burns as quickly as possible using lots of cold water. The longer a burn is left untreated, the more severe it becomes. If the area is large, soak a towel in water and lay it over the casualty. Thorough cooling may take as long as 10 minutes. If there's no water, use milk, beer or any non-flammable liquid. Cover the burn with clean, non-fluffy material like cling film to protect it from germs. If you're not sure how serious a burn is, always phone your doctor or hospital for advice. There is no cure for a scald or a burn. Um, a child is going to be scarred as a result of a, of, of a burn. And a moment's inattention in the home can result in a child being scarred for life. So prevention is very important. Keep toddlers out of the kitchen. Keep kettle flexes short. Run cold water before hot water in the bath. Look around your home and look at what you can do to make it a safer place for you and your family. If you find someone whose clothes are on fire, lie them down quickly. Put out the flames by starving them of oxygen. Either pour water over them or using a coat, blanket or rug, wrap the casualty up tightly to smother the flames. Don't use any man-made material like nylon, which may melt and stick to the skin, making the burn worse. If you're alone, don't panic and run about, as this will fan the flames. Instead, stop, drop to the floor, and keep rolling over until the fire is out. Accidental poisonings happen often in the home. Products like bleach, dishwasher powder, those things in the bathroom cabinet, alcohol, some kinds of plants, gases like carbon monoxide, can all cause poisoning for adults and children. The important thing to remember is that whatever the type of poisoning, the basic treatment is always the same. So if you can learn what to do for one situation, you'll always be able to help whatever the cause. In our next information film, we've reconstructed a poisoning emergency that happens all too often to children. It's a situation any one of us could be faced with, so you need to ask yourself, would you know what to do 
before the emergency services arrive. Kitty, Kitty, what are you doing? Oh, no! Oh, James, James, come quickly! What is it? What is I it? I think he just wanted some tablets. What should we do? What should Keep we calm. Do? I'll tell you what to do. The child's much more likely to panic if you do too, so you must stay calm. If she's got any tablets in her mouth, get her to spit them out straight away. OK, OK. Katie, can you open your mouth for Mummy? They aren't sweetest, love. Let's spit them out. Oh, good girl, good girl, Katie. But what should we do now? Uh, let's give her some salt water to make her sick. No, no, no. Don't try to make her sick. Tablets are absorbed so quickly into the bloodstream that there's probably no point. And salt water causes dehydration, which could make her feel much worse. Well, what are we supposed to do then? First, you need to find out how many tablets she's swallowed. I got them last week. I've only taken a couple. But it's half empty. Find out what kind of tablets they are and when she took them. What are they? What are they? Sleeping tablets. She must have seen me put them away earlier. What do we do now? You need to ring for an ambulance. Get somebody to stay with her, if possible, when you make the call. OK, I'll go. You stay with Katie. Don't forget to take the bottle with you. And the medical services will need to know exactly what she's swallowed. Emergency hello? Service, please. Ambulance, please. Right, hello? Please hello? Now. Please help. My little girl's taking some pills. OK, caller, what's your telephone number? It's 974-231. And your name and address? My name's Deborah Smith. Number five, Rally Road, in Knoll. OK, Deborah, do you know what kind of pills she's taken and how many? Yes, they're sleeping tablets. I'm not sure how many. It could be half a bottle. OK, look, don't worry. The ambulance is on its way. OK, thank you. They're on their way. She's dropping off to sleep. I don't know what's wrong. Something's wrong. Let's pick her up and walk her around to keep her away. No, you don't need to move her. Just shake her gently and keep telling her that everything will be OK. But it's not working. Don't let her fall asleep. It's highly likely that she's becoming unconscious, so you'll need to do the ABC of resuscitation. You need to check her airway, her breathing and her circulation. She's breathing. Next, lie her in the recovery position. This will help her to breathe and stop her choking if she's sick. But I'm not sure how to do that. Well, put the arm nearest to you at a right angle, keeping the palm of her hand facing up. OK. Bring the other arm across her chest and hold it against her cheek. Now lift the leg furthest away from you, bending it at the knee. Then gently roll her body towards you. That's it. Don't worry, Katie. Mum is here. You must keep checking her breathing and her pulse, because if she stops breathing, then you'll need to breathe for her. I can hear the ambulance. Hold on, get them. Carbon monoxide is a highly poisonous gas which can kill you. It's given off if you burn coal, oil, natural or colour gas, when there's not enough fresh air in the room or if your equipment is faulty. Usually, carbon monoxide and other harmful waste gases escape outside through a chimney or flue, but if they're blocked or covered, dangerous levels of carbon monoxide can build up in your room. When you breathe it in, it can have rapid and sometimes fatal consequences. It's hard to tell when you're suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning, but there are symptoms that you can recognise. You may start feeling tired, drowsy or slightly dizzy, have a bit of a headache or pains in your chest or stomach. It's easy to mistake these symptoms for a cold or flu, but if you have recurrent attacks of migraine and sickness, be aware the cause could be something in your own home. One of the main reasons carbon monoxide becomes a problem is because of a lack of ventilation. If you have air bricks or vents, make sure they always stay open and unobstructed. When it's very cold, the obvious temptation is to close all doors and windows. But if you seal up the room completely, you could be sealing yourself in with carbon monoxide and that could be fatal. If you think someone's suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning, act quickly. First get them into the fresh air and phone for an ambulance. There are some warning signs that carbon monoxide is in your home. 
If you have an older style water heater, look around it for signs of staining or discoloration. If the chimney is blocked, you may see sooty stains around the gas fire. If the fire itself is faulty, it'll burn with a yellow or orange flame instead of blue. If you spot any of these danger signs, get your appliances inspected by a Corgi registered firm. Gas fires, water heaters and central heating boilers should be professionally serviced every year and your chimney must be checked at the same time. When you're buying a heater, only choose one which has been tested for safety. Look for the British Standards label. And if you're buying a heater second hand, you should be extra careful. Ask for a guarantee and get it tested independently. Never try to do any gas fitting yourself. One mistake could be fatal. Leave it to the experts. Every year, thousands of children in Britain have accidents serious enough for them to need hospital treatment. More than half of them occur in and around the home. Most of those accidents could have been prevented. On average, three children a day die like that. More thought, more care could have saved them. Accidents to children aren't the same as accidents to adults. Most of them are to do with their physical and mental development. The kinds of accidents they have tend to depend on their age. There are no hard and fast rules as children do develop at different rates, but the Child Accident Prevention Trust does lay down certain guidelines. All small children put things in their mouths, but at what age do you think a child will actually spit something out that tastes unpleasant and could be dangerous? It's actually around two years old at the earliest, and possibly not until they're three. And how old would you say a child needs to be to walk down the stairs without a grown-up? They should be at least three. The stairs can be a very dangerous place, particularly for children any younger. But what about crossing a quiet street alone? The Child Accident Prevention Trust says at least eight years old, and something many of us don't realise, children can't judge the speed of cars and cope with busy traffic until they're 11 or 12. Children are not little adults. They don't know how to keep themselves safe. And remember, children of all ages are naturally imaginative, daring and inquisitive. Any emergency is distressing, but it often seems so much worse when children are involved. What we're about to show you is a reconstruction of a common enough situation that any of us might be faced with, and which tragically kills 20 children a year. Would you know what to do? Okay, keep calm. The first thing to do is to look into her mouth. Is there an obvious obstruction that you can take out? Well, I can't see anything. Well, look a bit further down. No, only reach for something that you can actually see. Otherwise, you might damage her throat. Okay. If she's breathing, ask her to cough. That might dislodge whatever's. Okay, Lucy, try and cough for me. That's it. Okay, good girl. Once more. Oh, for goodness sake, we can't just sit here trying to make her cough. It's not going to work. She can't breathe. What are we going to do? If you panic, the child will panic too. Bend her forward so her head is lower than her chest and give her five firm slaps between the shoulder blades. But isn't this going to hurt her? Yes, it might hurt a bit, but you must try it, because if you don't clear her throat, oxygen might not get to her brain, which could lead to brain damage or even death. But it's not working. It shouldn't we call an ambulance? Yes, but get somebody else to do it. Right. And make sure that they tell you it's coming. You stay with the child and keep checking her mouth to see if anything's been dislodged. That's right, darling, open your mouth. I can't see anything. You need to lie her on her back to do chest thrusts. I'll tell you how to do them. You need to measure two finger widths up from the point where the breastbone joins the ribs. Then use one hand only and do five sharp thrusts. These will force the air out and might get the obstruction out too. Keep reassuring her, though, because she won't like it. It's all right, darling, you're going to be all right. But it's not working. 
Do I just have to try something else? You must stay calm. Now, go back to the original back slaps. But we've tried these already. Don't give up now. Obstructions can take some time to work loose. It's not working. She's going blue. If she's going blue, it means that she's getting dangerously short of breath. There must be something else we can try. If the back slaps and chest thrusts aren't working, you'll need to do abdominal thrusts, also known as the Heimlich manoeuvre. But never do this on a child under a year old, as it could injure them. We don't know how to do that. You need to sit down behind her and put your arms around her waist. Clasp your hands together, one palm up, one down. OK, right. Then give a sharp pull inwards and upwards, below the ribs. Repeat this no more than five times. Two, three. Oh, that's <coughs> it is worse. And if she'd stop breathing, you'd have to breathe for her. It goes against, really, all our instincts to hit a child, but you may have to slap them that hard to get rid of a blockage. You'll have to judge when to call an ambulance. But remember, it's better to call and then cancel than leave it too late. Although we've shown you what it'd be like to cope with that kind of emergency, nothing can replace the value of going on a course. When buying a cycle helmet, always make sure it's got a safety standard mark inside. If the helmet doesn't have one of these three labels, it's unlikely to have been tested at all. As well as looking for the safety mark, it's important to make sure your helmet fits properly. Try it on before you buy and adjust the inside straps for a snug fit. The simple rule is that if it comes off easily with the strap done up, then it's too big. An ill-fitting helmet could be as bad as no helmet at all in the event of an accident. Always wear your helmet correctly. It should sit above the eyebrow and leave your ears free. It should have good all-round visibility and have good ventilation. Always replace your helmet if it's damaged in an accident. Any weakness will reduce its protection. Rosper suggests you buy a new helmet every three to five years, just because of normal wear and tear. But remember, wearing a helmet is no substitute for a real awareness of cycling safety. Most accidents involving cyclists happen when the roads are busiest, in the morning and evening rush hours. Always make sure you can be clearly seen. Wear bright or fluorescent clothing during the day, and at night always wear a reflective tabard, armbands or anything bright. You can also improve the visibility of your bike. It's a legal requirement to display a rear reflector at all times, and to use front and rear lights at night. You may only be fined between 30 and 50 pounds if you get stopped without lights, but as the police say, the maximum penalty is death. Make sure you can be heard. Put a bell on your bike so that you can let other road users know you're there. And get trained. Every year, local councils help over a quarter of a million children learn about cycle safety. Some may offer training courses for adults too. Heart disease is the Western world's number one killer. In Britain, it accounts for a third of all deaths. Now, would you know what to do if somebody you were with had a cardiac arrest? It's a race against time, you know. Every minute's delay means their chances of survival are reduced by 10%. It's vital that a specific sequence of events starts as soon as possible. It's called the chain of survival. You need to get help quickly, that's the first thing. Then buy time by beginning the ABC of resuscitation. Then you need to get a defibrillator to the casualty to give them a controlled electric shock to try to restart the heart. And of course, get them to a hospital for specialist treatment. We've reconstructed what it would be like if somebody you knew had a heart attack. You'd be faced with instant decisions. The choices you make would be crucial and could make the difference between life and death. Dave? Dave, what's wrong? I'm not sure. I've got this terrible pain in my chest. It, oh, it's probably just indigestion. It's, oh, it's getting worse. But darling, you're sweating. I, I don't know what to do. What should uh, I do? OK, keep calm. I'll tell you what to do. You've got to call 999 for an ambulance. 
He may be short of breath, grey, feeling sick and sweaty. But even if the symptoms aren't this obvious, you must tell the emergency services if you suspect it's a heart attack. Right, OK. Nick, Nick, yeah. run to the house. Phone for an ambulance. Hurry. Yeah. Okay. And let me know when it's coming. OK. It's all right, darling. You're going to be all right. Just don't move. I'm so sorry, love. Uh, but what do we do now? We can't just wait for the ambulance to arrive. Let's lie him down. No, right. that could make things worse. Don't do it. Uh, you need to relieve the strain on his heart and not make it work even harder. A relaxed, half-sitting position is best. Make sure that you've got a support for his back. What about that blanket there? As well as something under his knees. Uh, uh, is that better, darling? Uh, Mum? Are you sure? I've rung for the ambulance. This shouldn't be too long. If it's a heart attack and he collapses, oh, okay. it means he's had a cardiac arrest. Oh, Nick, I don't think he's breathing. What do we do now? Even though it's upsetting, you must stay calm. His heart has stopped beating normally and he's stopped breathing. The only way to help him now is to do the ABC of resuscitation. So now you'll have to lie him down. Can you move that bench back? Yes. OK. Right, I guess it. OK. Hey. Dave? A is for airway. You need to open his airway to make sure that he can breathe. Look for any obvious obstructions, then gently lift his chin and tilt his head back. OK, it's clear. Right. B is for breathing. You need to check if he's breathing. Listen carefully and feel for his breath against your cheek. Also look at his chest to see if there's any movement at all. He's definitely not breathing. <laughs> what now? C is for circulation. If his heart's still beating, then there'll be a pulse in the side of his neck. There's no pulse. What do I do now? He's dying. If he hasn't got a pulse and he's not breathing, then you're his only hope. It's going to be up to you to try to keep him alive. The first thing you must do is to get some air into his lungs. So you need to pinch his nose, take a breath, seal your mouth around his lips and blow into his mouth. Let the air come out, then do it again. Check to see that his chest is rising and falling. It's going to be all right, sweetheart. It's going to be all right. I promise. After two breaths, you've got to try to get his blood pumping around his body. But I don't know how. You need to do chest compressions. Find the bottom of his breastbone and measure two finger widths above it. Put the heel of one hand on the breastbone with your other hand on top. Press down firmly 15 times. Keep your arms straight and counting out loud can help you. OK, one and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight. Don't expect an immediate response. Just because you can't see it working doesn't mean that it isn't. And keep going until the experts take over. If you're first on the scene of an accident, you may well come across a casualty who looks perfectly OK, but their lives may be slipping away because they're suffering from medical shock. It's a condition that can be a killer unless you recognise and treat the symptoms. It's important to realise that real shock, medical shock, simply won't go away if you make somebody comfortable and give them a nice cup of tea. It's a warning that something's going dangerously wrong and action has to be taken immediately. Most cases of shock are caused by loss of blood, either internally or externally, and blood loss is most commonly due to injuries caused in road accidents. Shock is our very own emergency mechanism. In order to keep our most important organs supplied with oxygen, the blood is diverted to the brain, heart and kidneys. When this happens, our skin is left with a poor blood supply, which causes the most obvious sign of shock, pale grey skin which is cold and clammy to the touch. Another important sign is a weak pulse and as shock develops you'll also notice shallow but rapid breathing and fading consciousness. You might not be able to see the obvious cause of shock but if you recognize the symptoms you must act immediately. If shock isn't treated the blood supply to the brain and heart will eventually fail and this will result in unconsciousness, coma and even death. So if you suspect someone is in shock, make sure they're lying down. 
then raise their legs to just above hip height. This will help to channel the blood to the most important areas. Check they can breathe properly and stop any bleeding you can see. Keep them warm, but don't overheat. This will bring the blood back to the surface again, away from the vital organs. If someone hasn't already called an ambulance, or if you're on your own, you must get help now. Reassure the casualty and keep them calm. They'll probably be thirsty, but you must only moisten their lips. Don't let them drink, eat or smoke, as they might need an anaesthetic later. If they do become unconscious, put them in the recovery position and keep checking their pulse and breathing every two to three minutes and be prepared to carry out the ABC of resuscitation. Don't confuse shock with fainting. If someone simply fainted, they'll come round again, usually in under a minute, and will completely recover. Bleeding's not the only cause of shock, but it's always due to a sudden drop in blood pressure, like when large amounts of fluid are lost through diarrhea, vomiting and burns, or when a heart attack causes the circulation to fail. So the signs of shock are pale, cold and clammy skin, and the three most important things to do are to lay them down and raise their legs. Check their breathing and get help quickly. More than 20 million people in the United Kingdom have medical conditions which can't easily be seen but require special consideration in an emergency. Most of them are very experienced in preventing their own emergencies, but your help could be vital. The following three information films give advice on the three most common medical conditions that you're likely to come across, asthma, diabetes and epilepsy. In the UK, one child in seven now has asthma, but numbers are growing. Boys are twice as likely to develop it as girls, and it can be difficult to spot. Symptoms include a dry cough, wheezing, breathlessness, and a tight chest, which may be worse at night. In young children, an attack often follows a cold. There are two different types of medicine. Both are breathed directly into the lungs through special inhalers. Preventers are taken every day to help stop an attack. But once an attack started, you need a reliever, always in a blue inhaler, which opens up narrowed airways. Methings can trigger asthma. Cigarette smoke is especially harmful to young lungs. Smoking during pregnancy will increase the risk of your baby developing asthma. Everyone has different triggers, from pets and pollen to household dust mites, which live everywhere in the home, particularly in feather duvets and pillows. Using synthetics may help. Wash all bed linen at at least 60 degrees. Soft toys should be washable. If not, putting them in the freezer will kill any mites. If your child has asthma, tell the school and give them written information about their medicine. Most children of school age should carry their own reliever and someone at school should have a clearly labelled spare supply. Exercise and frosty air can also be triggers, but a puff of an inhaler before going out should be all they need. Remember, Olympic medals have been won by people with asthma. Asthma attacks can be very frightening for both children and parents. During an attack, a child will be coughing, wheezing and fighting for breath. It's important that you know what to do and stay calm. Hold their hand for comfort, but don't put your arm round them. It could make breathing more difficult. Sit your child in an upright position to ease their breathing. Give them their blue reliever immediately. Encourage them to relax and take slow, deep breaths. Don't give them any other medication. Even aspirin triggers asthma in 1 in 30 people. If the reliever has had no effect after 5 minutes, or the child is too exhausted to talk or still struggling for breath, dial 999 and make sure they continue to use their inhaler every few minutes until help arrives. Don't be afraid to make a fuss and don't leave it too late to call for help. Remember, an asthma attack is a dangerous thing and can be fatal. If your child stops breathing, be ready to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. It's much harder to get an asthmatic breathing again, but don't give up. It can be done.
our blood sugar levels are controlled by a hormone called insulin. It moves the sugar in the food we eat from the blood to the cells of our body where it's used to produce energy. If your body can't make enough of this hormone, you develop diabetes. You'll have to be careful what you eat and might need to take insulin by injection. If the blood sugar level of somebody who has diabetes suddenly drops, it can cause a condition called hypoglycemia, which can be dangerous. Problems happen most often because of missing a meal, but unexpected activity, too much exercise and alcohol can also upset the blood sugar level. Be aware that the body can start reacting very quickly and sometimes with no warning. Some early symptoms of hypoglycemia include trembling, sweating and looking pale. A shortage of glucose can affect the brain and cause confusion, unsteadiness and sometimes irrational behaviour. Remember that these symptoms can be mistaken for drunkenness. If you recognise these signs, it's important that you act quickly to raise their blood sugar levels as quickly as possible. Give them sugar or glucose tablets and then starchy foods like sandwiches and biscuits and a sweet drink. Keep giving them food until they recover. This should happen within about 10 minutes. If the blood sugar level falls very low, they could become unconscious. If this happens, don't give them a drink. Instead, smear something sweet like honey or jam between the cheek and the gums so the sugar can be absorbed quickly into the blood. Remember, you may need to call an ambulance. It's important to get them to hospital where they can be injected with concentrated glucose. Many people with diabetes keep prepared injections of glucose at home, but never inject someone unless you've been trained. If your child has diabetes, make sure the teachers know how to recognise and treat hypoglycemia. People with diabetes should carry that information with them, so the right help can be given. You can get testers or a machine for monitoring your blood sugar levels at home, which will help you to avoid emergencies. Epilepsy is caused by a brief disruption in the normal working of the brain. This affects the whole body, causing a fit or seizure. There are many different types, varying from what looks like a daydream to convulsions, where the body stiffens, falls and shakes, and a person may lose consciousness. Some people can help control their epilepsy by avoiding things they know can trigger their fits, including lack of sleep or food, stress or too much alcohol. People who have epilepsy need to take special precautions at home. Cookers and fires must be properly guarded and there's a real danger of drowning if they have a fit in the bath. So keep water shallow, make sure someone else is in the house and never lock the bathroom door. At the swimming pool it's important to tell the lifeguard in case they need to help. If you have epilepsy never swim alone and always wear a helmet if you go horse riding or cycling. Adults with epilepsy often find they're not allowed to drive, but new regulations mean they can reapply for a license after only one year without a seizure. If you have epilepsy, tell people. Carry a medical ID card or wear a bracelet giving details. Tell your friends and people you work with what to do if you have a seizure. Explaining your condition will help them to help you. Witnessing a seizure can be very disturbing, but don't panic, you can help. First, protect the person from injuring themselves. Cushion their head, loosen their clothing and stop people crowding around. Only move them if they're in danger and never put anything in their mouth. They won't swallow their tongue. A fit may be over in just a few seconds or may last several minutes. Their breathing is likely to be irregular. Their lips may be tinged with blue. Just stay with them until the convulsions stop and then place them in the recovery position. They should start breathing normally again quite quickly. Usually you won't need to call an ambulance. There's nothing worse for someone with epilepsy than waking up in hospital unnecessarily. But if the person is injured, has a series of fits, or if the fit lasts more than five minutes, or if a child has a seizure for the first time, dial 999. Having a fit can be as exhausting as running 30 miles. It can take up to two hours to fully recover. Listen and let them take control of their recovery.
Sports injuries are all too common. The most serious occur in the high-risk sports, like football here, rugby, cricket and hockey. In fact, football has the highest accident rate, some 350,000 or so every year. There are some guidelines you can follow to help reduce the rates of accidents on the sports field and to know better how to deal with the injuries. First of all, the Sports Council recommends that when playing organised sports, there always ought to be at least one person present who's trained in first aid. Of course, it's much better to prevent accidents happening in the first place. Always be aware of others around you when you're playing a sport. Cricket and hockey balls, rackets and other sports gear can all too easily cause injuries. You can cut down on the chances of being hurt by wearing protective gear for high-risk sports. Shin pads should be worn for football, a gum shield for hockey. Make sure your clothing and footwear fit well and that your equipment is the right weight and size for you. Torn muscles, tendons and ligaments are the most common injuries, especially in sports that need quick bursts of speed, sudden stopping and turning. At the first sign of trouble, always stop and rest. As soon as possible, put ice on the damaged area. Even frozen peas will do. But cover the ice pack with something, or it'll make the skin burn. Put a bandage on for support, but don't make it so tight it stops the blood flow and try to keep the injured part raised. Even minor injuries can take up to five days to heal, so don't be tempted to start exercising again too soon. It's also very common for people to get hurt in collisions on the field. If someone gets knocked on the head, always be aware of the risk of concussion. Check if they've lost consciousness, however briefly. Look at the eyes for focusing and dilation and ask about headaches. These symptoms don't always appear straight away, so keep a close eye on the injured person, and if they show any signs of concussion, take them to see a doctor. And with all head and neck injuries, you must be aware of the possibility of damage to the spine. It's easier than you think to break a bone. If that happens, try and support the limb in the position it's in, then take the person to hospital for an X-ray. And if you get something in your eye, don't rub it, it should clear itself. If not, try washing it or see a doctor. But remember, if you need to bandage one eye, make sure you cover them both, otherwise the damaged eye will continue to move with the good eye. Every year, people are needlessly paralysed by sports and road accidents. Would you know what to do if you were faced by a serious back injury? Would you be confident that your efforts to help would do more good than harm? The Midlands Centre for Spinal Injuries offers this advice. The majority of spinal injuries happen to young people. The most common cause is road accidents, but many sports and hobbies also involve an element of risk. Every year, 30 people are paralysed horse riding and 15 paralysed playing rugby. If you come across someone who's been involved in these kind of accidents, you need to remember that they could have a spinal injury. Look out for warning signs, pain in their neck or back, no control over their limbs, weak movement or no movement at all, tingling or burning sensations, or loss of feeling. If you think someone has a spinal injury, the most important thing to remember is don't move the casualty unless they're in immediate danger. When you come across a casualty who's suspected of having a spinal injury, there may be movement of the legs, no matter how weak. It's always important to remember that 90% of those people if they're treated well, may walk again and walk out of the hospital. Although it may be natural to try to move an injured person into a more comfortable position, or they may want to move themselves, you must keep them absolutely still. For support, put rolled blankets or clothes alongside them and keep them warm while you wait for medical help. In an emergency, if there is a danger of fire or they're not breathing and you have to move them, at least five people are needed to support their head, neck and back in the same position as you found them. The most preventable spinal injuries are those caused by diving, 
as many as 40 people a year are paralyzed in diving accidents. Check the depth of the water before you dive to make quite sure it's deep enough to enter head first. And always test the water beforehand by going in feet first. Swimming pools may have hidden ledges or steps you can't see. And remember, the depth and bed of rivers and the sea are being changed all the time by currents and tides. If you think someone lying face down in the water may have a spinal injury, try and get help to turn them over. Keep their head, neck and back in a straight line. Don't let the head twist or turn and don't attempt to sit them up. When someone has dived into the sea or into a river and had an accident, the general public have rushed in and grabbed them and taken them out without too much care or attention. The person may have had movement, but by the time they get out of the water, they have lost everything. Remember, what you do to help someone in those first few minutes after an accident may save someone from permanent paralysis. Extremes of temperature, both heat and cold, affect the body's ability to function normally and in some cases can do serious damage. Luckily, the body's got a sophisticated warning system, which if we recognise the signs can help us keep out of danger, both in extremely hot and cold conditions. In our next two information films, there's information on how to stay safe in the sun and how to prevent or treat somebody with hypothermia. Watch out for early signs that someone's in trouble. They may have intense shivering. They may lose control of their movements and start stumbling. They may have slurred speech. They may exhibit completely irrational behavior. One example is something called mountain disrobing syndrome, when people feel compelled to rip off their clothes, even though they're in freezing conditions. If you find a patient who you suspect is hypothermic, uh, you will find that their heart rate is very low, uh, that their respiration is very slow as well. Uh, they may be unconscious, quite often uh, unconscious, and they will feel very cold, rather like marble, particularly if you put your hand on their abdomen or under their armpit. It's important when you check the temperature of someone's armpit that you do so under their clothes. Stay warm yourself. Make sure you don't become a casualty too. Find shelter from the wind and rain. Lie them down. It can be dangerous to tilt a hypothermic person into an upright position as this lowers their blood pressure. Insulate them from the cold with blankets or a sleeping bag. A quarter of our body heat is lost through the head, so make sure the head is covered too. Warm them up slowly from the inside. Warm sugary drinks like tea will help. Don't give really hot drinks, hot water bottles or hot bars. They can cause them to collapse. Never give anything to eat or drink to someone who's unconscious. It's important that no alcohol is given. It can cause more harm than good. If they stop shivering, don't assume they're recovering. When the body temperature falls too low, warming mechanisms like shivering can cut out. But don't give up. People whose core body temperatures have fallen by as much as 15 degrees have been known to survive. And always seek medical help. Start your holiday wearing a high-factor sunscreen, nothing lower than number 15. Only work your way down as your skin gets used to the sun. Never spend more than 15 minutes sunbathing on the first day, and then build up slowly. Remember, burning is a delayed reaction. It reaches its peak 8 to 12 hours after you've been in the sun. Always avoid sunbathing between 11 in the morning and 3 in the afternoon, when the sun is at its hottest. Always wear a good pair of sunglasses. They'll do more than make you look good, they'll protect your eyes from damaging ultraviolet light. And never look directly into the sun. The best way to protect yourself is to cover up. Light cotton will keep you cool, but closely woven dark fabrics offer better protection. 
It's especially important to protect children during the summer. Babies under six months should be kept out of direct sunlight altogether. Older children still need a high-factor sunscreen and keep topping it up, especially if they're playing in the water. In really hot weather, it's easy to become dehydrated, so drink more water. And if you're abroad, make sure you buy it in bottles. People who really can't cope with the heat can suffer heat stroke. They'll get a headache, feel dizzy, confused and sick. Their pulse and temperature will go up dramatically and they may even become unconscious. Lie them in a cool place, call a doctor and, if possible, wrap them in a cold, wet sheet until their temperature drops. Make sure you catch the weather forecast. On sunny days, there's now a sunburn rating of low, medium, high and very high. We can learn a lot from what's happened in Australia, where they have the highest incidence of skin cancer in the world. But numbers have dropped dramatically since the start of their Slip, Slop, Slap campaign. If you're going to be in the sun, slip on a t-shirt, slop on some sun cream and slap on a hat. We hope you find the information in this video useful and you'll watch it again and again to refresh your memory. But remember, there's no substitute for going on a proper first aid course and learning these vital life-saving techniques at first hand. You'll find the addresses of organisations in the United Kingdom that run those courses in a minute. Remember, it can take as little as two hours to learn the ABC of resuscitation and how to put people into the recovery position. Two hours that can literally save a life. So find out how to get on one of those courses today. You never know when you may need to know what to do to save a life.